Okay, and Dan Neistat, thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, thank you for having me on the program. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And the first question I wanted to discuss with you is that TSMC is usually perceived in the West as a purely Taiwanese company. However, it has a global and international ownership. And could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, Richard, first of all, thanks a lot for having me on the show, and uh, I appreciate your time. And I always love to talk about semiconductors. So, anytime anyone wants to ask me about that, it's 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 a very fun topic. Okay. So, uh, for your question, um, there's two ways to answer it, and and one is simply the global semiconductor industry, which is one of the most globalized industries in the world. Um, the interesting thing about the industry overall is that no one part of it can operate independently without other parts. So the semiconductor industry was started in the United States. Uh, the United States uh, is the inventor of the transistor and then the inventor of the integrated circuit, which is what we commonly call today the semiconductor, which is what goes into your phone and powers your your phone, your computer and, and everything else. So. But then from there, it grew very substantially. I mean, there are European companies, uh, ASML in the Netherlands, um, Infineon in Germany, ST Micro in Switzerland. You know, there, are, there are a lot of real strong companies all over the world. Uh, J there are Japanese companies. In, in the mid-1980s, Japan was number one in the world uh, in semiconductors. And even down to today, when you look at how would you build a semiconductor industry, the answer is really um, there are companies in Japan that are the best at at certain things like the best in the world. When you buy something, materials in particular, you buy it from Japan. Uh, when you buy production equipment, you buy it from the Netherlands, from Japan, from the United States. Um, when you buy, I, I mean, if you, if you want computer chips, of course, Intel is one of the top and AMD is another top. So those are American companies. But uh, And then, of course, in Foundry, uh, the, the number one company in the world is, is from Taiwan. And memory chips, the number one companies in the world are, are in um, South Korea. So it's a really global industry and there's so much collaboration between the, the those industries that, that you really get a, a really nice overall view of the world. And when it comes to Taiwanese companies and TSMC being perceived as purely Taiwanese, well, first of all, it's, it's a semiconductor industry company. So it's, and it's also a very international company. So being part of that industry is already, you're part of that family, so to speak. And then the second part of that of the answer for that is that in terms of the way it was built and the way it's and its ownership structure, it, it's really quite international. So TSMC was founded by Morris Zhang, and he's he's an American. I believe he also has Taiwanese citizenship, but I, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure of his uh, of the Taiwan side. I am 100 percent sure of his American citizenship. Uh, he he left. He was born in China. He left China when he was a very young man. I think around 18 years old um, when he left. Uh, you know. He had he had been there for the invasion of of China by Japan. He had he had been there for the Chinese Civil War. I mean, he really his childhood was full of a lot of of conflict and strife. So when he arrived in the United States, he 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 spent his first year in the United States in Harvard uh, Harvard University, and from there uh, he he went to um, MIT. So one of the few people who may say they they left Harvard and in, in to go to <laughs> MIT, which is also yeah. a you know very highly prestigious school. Uh, and his, in his own words, he says, basically, uh, you know, he talked to a lot of his fellow students, his classmates, and everybody was talking about what they want to do later on. And he said, well, I want to be an engineer. And his classmates kept saying, what are you doing here? You should be at MIT. Because okay. I guess at the time, Harvard was not considered an engineering school. Yeah. So um, anyway, so for, I, I won't go too much, too much into that. But uh, so his, his background is all in the United States. And then he was, he was an executive at Texas Instruments uh, for a long time. He was very, he was very famous at the time as well. He, he did a lot for the production process uh, and he was the head of their um, production process lines in the semiconductor division, which if you're the head of the semiconductor division at TI, you're one of the top three people in the company because that is what, that is what the company does. Right. So, and then from there, he, you know, he, he, he did a few other things, but then he was invited to Taiwan to, to, to become the head of ETRI, which is the Industrial Technology Research Institute. When he arrived, uh, that's kind of a government run institute. And the government kind of said to him, you know, what we'd really like you to do is, uh, do you think there's anything we can do to start a, a new kind of business here or a company here? And so he came up with the foundry industry idea. And uh, from the beginning, I, I mean, again, in, in his own words, TSMC would not be here today without Philips Electronics. 
Philips is a Netherlands company. And the way that came about was, of course, the government, the Taiwan government wanted to build a company, but the, nobody likes a lot of risk. And so what they said to him was, you know, can you find a company to invest in this idea? Because this is a new idea and we're not very sure of it. And maybe it'll succeed, maybe it'll fail. But if you can convince a, a chip industry company to invest in it, then we'll believe in it and we'll we'll put money behind it as well. And, uh, and uh, he, you know, he says that he, he had approached Intel, he approached a couple other companies who turned him down. And then he talked to Philips and Philips was also a big electronics company, big in uh, semiconductors. Of course, their semiconductors uh, was spun off to NXP semiconductors. Uh, and it was really Philips who said, yeah, we'll, we'll invest in this. And, and Philips bought a 27.5% stake in the company. And then a, the, another 27.5% stake was bought by a Taiwan government bureau, which is called the National Development Fund. And then uh, the government found other investors to, to kind of bring in for the rest of the, that stake, which was Taiwanese investors. And of course, when they say the government did it, uh, they're kind of calling people and saying, we want you to do this. They're not really saying, hey, would you do this? And so for for a lot of the Taiwanese investors that in the in the beginning at TSMC, they probably didn't even really know what they were getting into, but then they 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 put the money in anyway because they were asked to by the government. So and that's the that's the beginning of TSMC. And so from the get-go, you have a big presence from the Netherlands and from uh Philips, which was also a, a major customer of TSMC. And then there's where part of the international part comes in, which is you know, almost all their customers are international customers at that time. And their major customers are companies like Motorola, Intel, Philips, uh, probably uh, ST Micro and, and, and other companies as well who, who were, were able to use their production lines uh, quite immediately because at the time they could sh farm out their older chips to be produced by TSMC while they were working on trying to make more cutting edge products. So it was a relationship that worked out very well for everybody. And then of course, uh, so you fast forward from that. Um, Philips has always had, uh, nowadays it would be NXP, but they've always had a presence on TSMC's board of directors. So for a long time, it was Philips, and then it was NXP, who was spun out from Philips. And then down to today, I, I wouldn't say it's it's uh, NXP anymore, but Sir Peter Bonfield, who uh, was previously was the CEO of, uh, of NXP Semiconductors, I, I believe he's retired uh, right now, um, but he's still on the board of TSMC. So you have that relationship that's lasted the entire time from, from the founding of TSMC all the way up until now. Yeah. So then, um, so, so you have that international presence and you have that collaboration that goes on within the industry and, and the people that remained important to TSMC and, and to Morris Chang himself. So, and then another thing that was done intentionally to make TSMC more international was they, they listed their stock on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, it's called an ADR, an American Depository Receipt, which is a, sh a share that's based on the shares in the Taiwan. Uh, it's kind of a, or I, sh I should say there's a valuation, but the, the actual shares are, are in the US. They're, it's 30% of the company, I believe, right now. Um, so there you have they tr another attempt to internationalize by having the shares listed there, which means the local company, TSMC itself, has to follow the accounting guidelines. And of course, some companies believe that's very important because you, you want to have, you want to be held to a high standard. And you and in the U.S. at least you have uh, in, you have accounting standards that are in place and you all, that, that are required by the exchanges, and then you also have a lot of investors that are looking at you and they're really scrutinizing what you're doing and they're really ah, they can be critics. I mean, they can be really tough. And for a lot of companies, that's stressful. But for for any company that wants to stay in business, it's it's kind of good to have people looking at you all the time and pointing out things and asking questions and. And because in the end, of, at the end of the day, it'll it'll make you think about things you might not have thought about, and it'll it'll push you to 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 kind of in directions that you might not want to go or you might not have considered before. It'll make you think about. Uh, it'll basically just make you kind of think a little bit more about your business than you might otherwise do so. So I think those are a couple of ways that the company is quite international, and and uh, and and actually, uh, Morris Chong himself. Uh, he remained a U.S. citizen all the way through 2018, and I know that because that's in TSMC's annual report. You know, so the founder and chairman of the company was an American, and then today Mark Leo is is also listed as a U.S. citizen. So from the founding, the the chairman of TSMC is in fact a U.S. citizen, even though sometimes people will will raise the ethnicity uh, situation. But I, you know, I, in America, I don't think anybody would ever say that somebody is. 
other than what they are. You know, if you say you're a U.S. citizen, you're a U.S. citizen and you, you must have the passport and whatnot to prove it. So, um, yeah, so that's where it's at. Yeah. And then also what you just mentioned that accounting and uh, transparency, that's quite different from what Chinese companies do nowadays and on the New York Stock Exchange, right? They, they avoid any kind of scrutiny. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's hard not to think a bit of that is, is a misunderstanding because what, what China's government seems to be saying is that we don't want, we don't want another country to tell us what to do and to, and to create accounting standards for us. But, but in fact, I wouldn't even say these are U.S. I guess they are backed by U.S. government laws, but the rules are set up by the exchanges. So if you're, if your stock is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the rules are set up by the exchange that you have to follow. But then the, but then the, yeah, the U.S. SEC requires an awful lot of, of uh, information as well. And look, China's a, I guess we don't say this as often as, as we used to, but it's still a communist country. And they still want to do things their own way. And, and of, of course, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But the minute you list your shares, if you're a company, the minute you list your shares on another country's stock exchange, you, you really have to understand that you're going to have to follow certain rules of that country. So that's a difficult situation, I guess. Yes, but that's also interesting because you mentioned the stock exchange, but the media omits this. They always uh, mention the U.S. government that, they, they, that the Chinese companies don't adhere to U.S. standards. But you're saying that's kind of an issue of the exchange, yes? Uh, partly it is, yeah, because the exchange tends to make up to make the rules, but then it, it is all backed by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the U.S. So, so yeah, I mean, in the back there really is the the federal government really is is in there as well. But but yeah, that but but again, if you choose to list your shares yes, in another exactly. country, <laughs> you might have to follow some of their rules. Yeah. Yeah, okay, because you get the advantages and yeah, you also have to follow the rules. That's okay. right, that's right, Question that's right. I want to ask you um, that uh, we, <clears throat> we, we know that, that um, there must be some people in China who probably realize that they can't read Taiwan's sophistication with regards to sem semiconductors. And also that even if they would be able to run the Taiwanese fabs, they still, uh, even if they could seize them, they wouldn't be able to run them. So do you think that this awareness could influence um, China's fear of sanctions and maybe also their political decisions? Well, the first part of that is easier than the second part. I, I really, I really am not, uh, I, I find it difficult to, to figure out what China's thinking, you know, and, and what affects their political decisions. Because and and with semiconductors, one of the dangers of the industry is is that a lot of people don't understand the industry. Um, and I can tell you from for one thing, I've been I've for my job, I used to have to visit China quite often, and we would walk through factories and and see what was going on. And and we had investments, and most of our investments were in Taiwan companies, but they were operations. You know, the operations were in China. And I, I was struck because I, I heard many times from Chinese executives in particular that would say, oh, we're, you know, we're building a semiconductor industry and we're going to do it just like the steel industry. And I, I, I made the mistake once of saying, yeah, you, you don't build a semiconductor industry, anything like a steel industry. It's completely different. And, and uh, of course, then I had a guy just kind of telling me why I was wrong. And, you know, and, and all he was really saying was, was, was kind of stuff you hear all the time, which, which is kind of communist party, propaganda that that kind of gets thrown out there and then is repeated and repeated and repeated. And so I, I just didn't say anything after that. I'm like, hey, if you guys want to make the mistake, it's an expensive mistake to make. But uh, that is not the way to build an industry, a semiconductor industry. It takes which a lot of time. That they Sorry. lack the awareness, which would mean probably be that at the top, they maybe lack the awareness and they really think as long as they keep throwing hundreds of billions at the industry, it might work one day. But That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Good. So the third question is, um, there has been a lot of criti criticism towards China in the West about, uh, you know, the, the slogan that Chinese are stealing our jobs. However, as TSMC CEO recently stated, um, I quote here, the US simply doesn't have the fabrication talent pool needed to expand and succeed. And he also added its education system can't deliver the thousands of skilled manufacturing workers that are needed, end of quote. So isn't it um, then that East Asian policies are more conducive to the development ma and manufa of manufacturing and in certain industries than maybe in the West? That 
is that's that's not a bad way to say it uh, because there are in semiconductor manufacturing in particular there are a lot of subsidies uh, for manufacturers and so the policy in a lot of East Asian countries in Taiwan in particular South Korea in particular they they want to build this industry and so they're they they spend time understanding what the industry is and how much it costs and all of these other factors. And then what they'll do is, of course, they, they have students going to the United States and to Europe and to other countries, Japan, and, and to, to, to take engineering courses there where the, you know, a lot of the top professors are and, and uh, school programs are. But then when, when they come back and start building their own industry, they, they, the government already understands that they need to set aside First, they need to have the right electricity in place. They need to have the right water in place. They need to have all the infrastructure that's, that, that they can available. And then they offer tremendous subsidies and tax breaks uh, because, yeah, one semiconductor fab can cost, I, I mean, it's it's around $10 billion now. And it's and that number is only growing and it's growing very fast because I think TSMC's forecast for their for their you know advanced generation two nanometer fab is, is something like $18 billion or $20 billion. And, and to be honest, when you hear that number, it's a huge number, but really 80% of that money is going out of Taiwan. It's going to the equipment providers because that is for the equipment. So here again, you know, the numbers that are thrown around can sound one way, like there's a benefit in one place and not other places. But when TSMC says they're going to spend 20 billion on a fab, yeah, 16 billion is going to go to go around the world uh, to buy equipment, production equipment from other countries. And so that's, that's a benefit right there, but you're, you're absolutely right with the idea that it's these subsidies that, that are very helpful, which, you know, the United States often doesn't offer any subsidies and it's, it's a real burden for U S companies. So the chips act, which is being discussed right now in the U S and, and for it's, it's been dragging on and on. And for some reason it, it hasn't been passed. And, and I look at that sometimes and I just think, I, I know that there are people in the U.S. government that that really understand the issue and are probably pulling their hair out. And I'm glad I don't have to fight that battle. But but yeah, things like the Chips Act in the U.S. that's that's extremely important because everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is offering these subsidies. I, I honestly, if I were the owner of a company and I was building a chip factory, I would. I'm American and I love my country, but I would say, wait a minute, this country will give me a couple billion dollars in incentives to build a factory there and you don't want to give me anything. Hmm. You know, what's yeah, so your decision yeah. is kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's big money. It's very big money. So it, it, it makes it difficult. So it's like the U S is now kind of catching up a little bit, maybe too late, maybe late, but, but they are still doing the right thing now. Well, that's I, hopefully, because of course, Europe has also talked about a chips act and have put, have put in place some, some, uh, legislation as well. So, so you know, from from a beginning, hopefully it can it can grow a bit more. Uh, but then again, you know, another question that that TSMC raised was the costs because uh, TSMC. Well, of course, the subsidies will help with the costs right away. Uh, yes. Then, because TSMC, what they had found was their U.S. fab. They do have one fab in the U.S. called WaferTech. Uh, it, the, no matter what they did, the costs were always 50% more than Taiwan. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of, that's a big difference in cost. And it, and in this chip industry, you wouldn't really think it's going to be that big of a difference in cost because most of your cost is in the, is in the production equipment and the factory itself. Workers are, you're, usually workers are only about, you know, 5% or less of the cost of the overall fab of the overall operation. So, um, I, I don't really know what the details of that 50% in, increased cost would be other than a portion of that would be the subsidies for sure. The rest of it, I don't know what that is. So, but, but yeah, but you start with the subsidies. So now the West is putting in the subsidies and you, you also have to get education involved because for a long time you've had the manufacturing leaving your country. And so is a student going to go to university and think, oh, I, I want to get a degree in this industry that's leaving the country. No, of course not. They want to try to f get a degree in something that where they they have a potential job future. Yes, and so yeah, you, the part that I was referring to, yeah, that it's kind of we are losing the edge in terms of also education and you know the whole infrastructure, maybe legal, maybe uh, taxes. Yeah, not only the subsidies. I think it's much broader, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, good. Thank you for your time, Dan, and the very very extensive explanations. Thank you very much for your time.
Thanks a lot, Richard. I appreciate the interview. Thank you. Okay.